Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes presents The Big Story. Get out of my way, you Ronnie. What'll it be, Chester? Right straight, Bob. Looking for someone? Roy. Ask Big Lenny there. Hey, Lenny. Hiya, Chess. I didn't see you come in. Seen my stupid brother-in-law? No. What's he done? A rat. I got a Lulu for us way down in Butte already and right when that punk's hiding out on me. Hiding out? Yellow punk. One of these days, if he don't do like I say, I'll put a bullet through his ears myself. The Big Story. Here is America, its sound and its fury, its joy and its sorrow, as faithfully reported by the men and women of the great American newspapers. <laughs> Helena, Montana. From the pages of the independent record, the story of a reporter who gambled his own life to avenge a murder. Tonight to Alan Copperthwaite at the Helena, Montana independent record for his big story goes the Pell-Mell $500 award. against throat scratch. Enjoy the smooth smoking of fine tobacco. Smoke a Pell-Mell. Yes, smoke a Pell-Mell. Then discover how Pell-Mell's greater length of fine tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Remember this. The further your cigarette filters the smoke through fine tobaccos, the milder that smoke becomes. At the first puff, pell smoke is filtered further through fine tobaccos than that of any other leading cigarette. Then what's more, after five puffs, or ten, or seventeen by actual measure, pell greater length of traditionally fine tobaccos still travels the smoke further, filters the smoke, and makes it mild. Thus, pell fine, mellow tobaccos give you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. So smoke pell famous cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. Helena, Montana. The story as it actually happened, Alan Copperthwaite's story as he lived it. Paul Rogers. 29-year-old Butte service station attendant was found missing from his post 4.30 this morning. Sheriff Mark Duncan of Silver Bow County responded to the alarm of two men who drove up to the East End Station for gas and found the place unattended. Approximately $50 in cash is missing from the register. Oh, that's how it began for you, Alan Copperplate, state editor of the Independent Record. But this little story which comes tapping off the Associated Press teletype, informing you that your lifelong friend, Paul Rogers, is missing. Your job holds you to your desk for an hour after the receipt of the first message. But immediately afterwards, you're in your car, racing the 66 miles from Helena to your hometown of Butte, racing to find out what you can do to help Sheriff Mark Duncan find your friend. We got there maybe 4.44 this morning, Ellen. Any signs of a fight, Sheriff? No, none. There was a half-eaten sandwich, a container of coffee, and an upended oil drum. Cash register keys show any prints? Oh, badly smudged. What's your next step? Well, the police radio car is giving out with a description of Paul. Right now, there's maybe 30 men in the big room next door I gotta talk to. <laughs> You sit among the solemn men and boys in the big room, waiting for the sheriff to speak. You know it would be out of place, Alan Copperthwaite. But if you had the opportunity, you'd like to shake the hand of each one of these people and thank them. Because these are volunteers, many of them who had never even met your friend Paul Rogers, who knew nothing of his honesty, his sense of humor, his kindness. And yet they were all here in the early hours of the morning. All right, quiet. Quiet, everybody. Now, quiet, please. Quiet. It looks bad. It's almost three hours now since Rogers disappeared. 
My deputies will break you up into searching parties. Some of you will take the town, some of you the side roads near town, some of you the abandoned mines. I want every inch of ground gone over. Within an hour after the men and boys had formed brigades and left the county building, the work begins. Every abandoned building in and around Butte is opened and searched. The bushes along every side road are carefully examined. Look out down there! Abandoned mines are gone through, sometimes at the peril of a volunteer's life. One day, two days, three, four days. Four days and nights of endless search. And nothing, absolutely nothing, is turned up as to the whereabouts of your friend, Paul Rogers. They're running a fever, Sheriff. You ought to stick to your office on a night like this. Oh, I can't, Ellen. There's a search going on. I got the reward up to $1,150 now. You... You think he's dead by now? Well, he's been missing four days. What can I do? Well, you and I know we're up a blind alley. At a standstill. But whoever took Paul away mustn't know that. Whoever took Paul away mustn't get a minute's rest. That's what you can do. It doesn't seem like much. But that's what you do in the next few days. Police officers today intensified their search into the mysterious disappearance of Paul Rogers. Today, Sheriff Mark Duncan announced that he had extended the police dragnet to every border of the state. Today, authorities announced that they anticipate an early solution to the mysterious disappearance of Paul Rogers. Day after day, you pounded out, Alan Copperthwaite. Stuff you'd written dozens of times as a reporter. Stuff you'd read dozens of times as an editor and never believed. But you had no way of knowing at this point the effect you were having 234 miles away in the city of Billings on a thin-faced little man named Roy Stolper. Lenny, have a drink with me, Lenny. What for? I, uh... I want to talk with you before Chester comes in. Anything you've got to say, you can say it to me in front of your brother-in-law. You don't understand, Lenny. I got a proposition for you. Like what? You're a gambler. Take a chance with me. On what? On $1,150. What are you talking about? Don't stall me, Lenny. You know, the job me and Chester pulled down in Butte. I didn't want to. Lenny, I didn't want to, but he made me do it. Just because I married his sister, he thinks he owns me. Where's Snivelin? What do you got in that rotten little mind of yours? I got to get away. I got to get away from here. I need money. They got a reward out. $1,150. Turn him in, money. Turn Chester in. Get the money. Just give me enough to get away from Billings. He'll never know who turned him in. You snake, you dirty little snake. Now let go of me, Lenny. Let go of me. If I ever told Chester, he'd kill you. But he's going crazy. You don't understand. He's making me pull jobs in and filling with him in broad daylight. We'll get caught. He's he going crazy. Oh, Lenny, do it. Do it, Lenny. So I can get away. Before I turn on Chester, I'd sooner see you dead. Honey, are you home? That's funny. She called me to come home, but she ain't here. Hello, Roy. What are you doing here? Your wife's my sister. Or did you forget? What do you want, Chester? Sit down, brother-in-law. Your knees are knocking. I, I don't like it when you make fun of me like this. I don't like it. It always means you're going to do something to me. Why should I want to hurt you, Roy? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I can tell. What have you been up to that I should want to hurt you, Roy? I, I didn't say I was up to anything. I didn't say that at all. What kind of proposition were you making Lenny over at Ma Peterson's? Opposition? I, I I don't even know what you're talking about. You rat! Oh. You rotten little rat. Don't oh. lie to me. Don't ever lie to me. Chester, you're hurting me, Chester. I... Bob Peterson said that you, you had your horns locked together earlier tonight at her place. What were you cooking up? Lenny, Lenny's a pal.
telling you, Janie. What, what would I be talking about with Lenny? That could hurt you. Lenny's a friend of yours. Ask him. Okay. What? What did Lenny tell you? He said you were just complaining as usual about me. Yeah, I told you. That's all it was, Chester. Lenny told you the truth. And I'm not taking any chances on you blowing your top. We're leaving town. Where are we going this time? You'll find out when we get there. Copper Thwaite. Alan, we need you. What's happened, Sheriff? Meet me at the morgue. We found him in a gravel pit three miles out of town. Well, how long do you... And he must have been killed only a few hours after the kidnapping. They? Two bullets in his back, one through his right eye. They must have let him out of their car, told him to run for his life. One of them plugged him in the back, and the other finished him off. The two bullets in his back, and one through his eye, are different calibers. best friend, Paul Rogers. His laughter was dead. His honesty was dead. His life with his girl was dead. Murdered. And you, Alan Copperthwaite, as state editor of your paper, are chained to your desk reading local items about picnics, church festivals, about poultry shows, about the sale of Ranch A to Man B. And all the time, your mind strains to break free from your desk. So much so that it takes a little while before the flood of items off the teletype from Billings, Montana, begins to catch your eye. Last night, two unidentified gunmen robbed a hamburger stand on the south side of Billings. Late this afternoon, two unidentified gunmen stole an automobile owned by Mr. and Mrs. Frank Belson, first locking the couple in the trunk of the car and releasing them three miles south of the city. After this morning's holdup of the Main Street service station by two masked gunmen, Billings police announced their belief that the city is in the grip of a two-man crime wave. A two-man crime wave. Were they the two? The sheriff was looking for them in Butte and Helena. Could they actually be 234 miles away in Billings? Why not? Why not? Molly, give me the boss. Harry, this is Al. I'd like to come in and talk with you about my vacation. Yeah, I know it's not due till October, but I'd like to have it now. Why? I think I've got some friends I'd like to see in Billings. Guard against throat scratch. Enjoy the smooth walking of my Yes, smoke a pell-mell and discover how pell-mell's greater length of fine tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat, filters the smoke, and makes it mild. At the first puff, pell-mell smoke is filtered further than that of any other leading cigarette. And what's more, after five puffs, or ten, or seventeen by actual measure, pell-mell's greater length of traditionally fine tobaccos still travels the smoke further, filters the smoke, and makes it mild. Thus, Pell-Mell's fine, mellow tobaccos give you a smoothness, mildness, and satisfaction no other cigarette offers you. Guard against throat scratch. Enjoy the smooth smoking of fine tobaccos. Smoke a Pell-Mell. Wherever you go today, notice how many people have changed to Pell-Mell. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Enjoy the smooth smoking of fine tobaccos. Smoke a Pell-Mell. Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes. Outstanding. And they are mild. This is Cy Harris, returning you to your narrator and the big story of Alan Copperthwaite as he lived it and wrote it. 
Now, at last, you're free, Alan Copperthwaite. Free from your debt. Free to do legwork. Free to submerge yourself in the cheap saloons and beer parlors and Billings Skid Row. If Billings' two-man crime wave was being pulled off by the same men who killed your friend, Paul Rogers, you'd get on their trail soon enough. In a city the size of Billings, with a population of only 30,000, and with an underworld whose population was less than 1,000, the odds were with you. The Silver Dollar, the Pink Lady, the Ranch House, Eagle's Head, the dance hall, paradise. You go through them all, night after night. And your eyes and ears and senses are as keen as any hunters ever were. But your time is beginning to run out. You realize that very quickly one night. I'll have another beer. No more for you, mister. Why not? Move on, mister. What for? I said move on. Makes my customers nervous to have a guy sitting around nursing his beer, just being quiet... Move on, mister. So you move on wearily, your senses reeling with the strain and effort of watching and waiting and listening. And when you head for the door to leave at Ma Peterson's Bar and Grill, a little incident occurs which means nothing to you at the moment. (coughs) Why don't you look where you're going? Sorry, mister, I was just going out. Didn't see it come in. I ought to break your skinny neck for you. I said I was sorry. Come on, beat it. If you hadn't been so tired, you wouldn't have staked your 135 pounds against the hulk of the bitter, angry man who towered at least a foot over you. So you head away from Ma Peterson without realizing that the big man who had threatened to break your skinny neck was at that very moment taking a step which before long might mean your life. I'm not lending you any money, Lenny. Ma, you got to. I'm in a fix. Who fixed you? Little like. I shouldn't have done it, Ma. We shot some traps. I'm $630 into him. I can't do nothing for you. But you got to. Everybody knows you lend money. I'll pay you your regular rate. Sure, I lend money. But you got nothing to put up for it. So you ain't getting any. Ma, you don't understand. I can't fool around with him. I promised him the money. <laughs> well, little like is no more than half your size. What's a big guy like you scared of, Lily? I'm scared because the bigger you are, the easier to mark for a bullet. Ma, lend me the money, will you? Now. The following night, more desperate now because your face is becoming familiar, you start the routine all over again, Alan Copperthwaite. The silver dollar, the pink lady, the ranch house, eagle's head, the dance hall, paradise. By midnight, you're back again at Ma Peterson's Bar and Grill. To your left at the bar sits a little man with a face as hard as flint. Despite his size, there's something about him which tells you that he's afraid of nothing. And you get your proof soon enough when the giant of a man who ran into you the night before comes into the bar and walks meekly up to the little man near you. You strain to catch every word of their conversation. Where's my money? I, I'll get it for you, Ike. When soon? It's not soon enough. When? Uh, uh, tomorrow. From who? Uh, from who? You heard me. From, uh, from Ma Peterson. You're lying. She won't lend you a cent. Uh, I'll get it for you, Ike. When? I said I'd get it for you. How? Oh, they get it for how? you. How? That's my business. It's mine too. How? It's more than a grand. It's mine for the asking. I said how? It's more than a grand. It's mine for the asking. <laughs> $1,150 if you want to know. That crazy jukebox. Who turned on the jukebox? Now you can't hear a thing. They're just talking. The giant of a man and his little tormentor. You're positive you heard him right. He said $1,150. Was it a coincidence? Or was it the reward money he was talking about? Now they've ended their conversation. The big man they call Lenny is getting ready to leave. If he walks out, you may never see him again. How could you make sure, Alan Copperthwaite, it was the reward money he was talking about? What can you say to him? You've got to say something. You've got to chance it. Lenny, what do you want? I, I've been looking for you. What about? About this kidnapping down in Butte. What? Uh, what do you know about it? I know plenty. I know a fellow once that fell off the cliff. He was top-heavy from having too much in his head. 
Let's take a little walk, mister. Hey, why don't we have a drink? I want to... Let's take a little walk, mister. Uh, it's my arm you've got. I know. Let's take a little walk. Outside, it's dark and cold. And the street is deserted. Big Lenny has a crushing grip on your arm. You'd made contact with him, all right. What now? What were you going to do now? Talk, mister. If you know who pulled that job in Butte, I can get you the reward fast and quiet. You're lying. You're a friend of Chester's. Who? You're lying. You'll squeal on me. You're a friend of Chester's. Now, get away from that street life. Move. Get into that alley. The night is cold, but the sweat is pouring down Big Lenny's face. If you weren't thinking about your own life at the moment... You'd be fascinated by the strange mixture of fear and murder, which is motivating this big man who has shoved you up against a wall in a dark alley. Uh, tell me who put you on to me. Nobody. you got to believe me. The yeah. sheriff from Butte's a personal friend of mine. I can get you the reward easy and quiet. How do I know you're on the level? You need the money. I overheard you talking with that little man at the bar. I think he'll knock you off unless you come up with the money. I don't need any advice. How do I know you're on the level? You just tell me who and where those two men are, and I'll prove to you I'm on the level. How do I know you're not a friend of Chester's? Look, here's the nearest phone. I'll put through a call to the sheriff in Butte. You can talk to him yourself and tell him what you know. I don't care about that punk Roy. But Chester's a friend of mine. Paul Rogers was a friend of mine. It ain't easy to turn in a friend. But I need the money. It's my life for his. I need the money. Lenny's hand on your arm grows limp and drops away. You watch his miserable, sweating face as he struggles with himself. The struggle of every man who has turned in a friend for money. It's not a pleasant thing to watch. Under other circumstances, it would have sickened you as it would any decent human being. But now you watch every move of his face until you see your opportunity. You've got no choice, Lenny. What? What do you mean? You know who pulled that job in Butte. Uh, if you don't tell, you can be picked up for obstructing justice. Uh, if the little man inside that bar doesn't get you first. Uh, Roy Scoville and Chester Pritchett did it. They're back in Butte right now at the Farmer's Hotel. <laughs> be in there, Sheriff. Unless the hotel clerk didn't see them go out. You men don't crowd in like this. Spread out in case they try to make a break for right. Okay, I'll try it again. Who's there? Hotel clerk. What do you want? I want to talk to you about your bill, sir. What about... Up with your hands. Chester, it's the law. There he is, asleep. What's that? Get up off that bed. What's Reach. this about? Which one of you is Scoville and which one is Bridget? That's him. He's Chester Pritchard. He, he made me do it. Shut up. No, I won't. I told you. I told you I'd get up. He made you do what, Scoville? The job here in Butte. All those holdups and billings. I'll kill you. Shut your mouth. I'm not afraid of him. Not anymore. I've got nothing to be afraid of anymore. I married his sister. That was my mistake. Anytime he wanted me to do anything, he'd get her to go to work on me. I knew it would end this way. I knew it. No, I'll talk. I'll tell you everything you want to know. And he does. The frightening story of the power one man can have over another. Power enough to get him to agree to rob and kill. But for you, Alan Copperthwaite, there was to be one final little irony. It took place in Sheriff Mark Duncan's office the day Big Lenny Watson collected his reward money. 1100, 1120, 1140, 1150. Here's your money, Watson. All of it. Hey, how about a thank you, Lenny? What for, reporter? What did you ever do for me? <laughs> In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Alan Copperthwaite of the Helena, Montana Independent Record with the final outcome of tonight's big story.
Guard against throat scratch. Enjoy the smooth walking, the fine tobacco. Smoke a pell mell. Yes, smoke a pell mell. Then discover how pell mell's greater length of fine tobaccos filters the smoke on the way to your throat. Filters the smoke and makes it mild. Remember this: the further a puff of smoke is filtered through fine tobaccos, the milder it becomes. Guard against throat scratch. Enjoy the smooth walking, the fine tobacco. Smoke a pell mell. Smoke pell mell, famous cigarettes, outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Alan Copperthwaite of the Helena, Montana, Independent Record. Murderers in tonight's big story were sentenced to life imprisonment at Montana State Penitentiary at Deer Lodge, where they are this very day. Although I could not bring my friend Paul Rogers back to life, I feel that in some small measure I was able to prove my everlasting friendship for him. Many thanks for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Copperthwaite. The makers of Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes are proud to present you the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station, when Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Johnstown, Pennsylvania Democrat. Byline, Leo W. Sheridan. A big story about a reporter who lived up to a lifelong promise made to a loyal friend. And remember, every week you can see another different big story on television brought to you by the makers of Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes. The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with original music composed and conducted by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was adapted by Abram S. Guinness from an actual story from the front pages of the Helena, Montana, Independent Record. Your narrator, Bob Sloan, Bill Lipton, play the part of Alan Coppersway. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic Big Story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with exception of the reporter, Mr. Copperthwaite. <laughs> Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes. Friends, sometime between March 13th and April 13th, letters and closing Easter seals will be sent to Americans in all states and territories. When you receive the letter, we urge you to buy Easter seals for this money serves the needs of crippled children of all ages, races, and creeds. Lend a hand. Help crippled children. Buy the Easter seals you receive. Here's an important message from the National Tobacco Tax Research Council. This fact-finding organization calls to your attention the fact that you smokers give nearly $2 billion a year to your government in cigarette taxes. Every time you buy cigarettes, you give your federal government eight cents a pack and most of you give three or four cents more to city and state governments. Now that adds up to better than a 50% tax on every cigarette you smoke. Yes, in buying cigarettes, over half your packs go for tax.